Welcome to Women's Human Rights Campaign, uh, Feminist Question Time. Women's Human Rights Campaign is a leading global organisation speaking on women's sex-based rights. Our main focus is defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you'll find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights which has been signed by 16,824 people from 132 countries and is supported by 337 organizations. This week, we're working or thinking about women's sports. We've got Beth Steltzer from the United States, who is, co is founder of Save Women's Sports. We have Rochelle Dean from the Bahamas, who is the Women's Human Rights Campaign country contact for the Bahamas. and. Uh, networking in the Caribbean. We have Paola from Italy stroke Japan, who's a member of Radfem Italia, and Emma Hilton from the UK, who's a developmental biologist and co-founder of Sex Matters. So we're going to start off today uh, hearing from Beth Steltzer, and I'm so pleased to welcome you. There's so much going on in the States at the moment, and Beth's been right at the centre of all of it, sport being, you know, the cutting edge of what's happening on women's sex-based rights and coming up to the Olympics, it's just everybody's thinking about it. Plus with what's happening with the Biden administration proposing to change the definition of women to, from being based on biology to gender identity. So really, thank you so much for coming to speak to us and over to you, Beth. We do have a lot going on in the States and it has been crazy for me to be this average woman on the front lines. Why I'm talking to you today, I trained to start powerlifting, which is the squat, the bench and the deadlift. Here's a picture of me squatting. And here's the deadlift. At my first competition, the Women's Minnesota State Championships, a male basically threw a hissy fit. They protested with their little goonies all throughout the event, chanting at us that we should share the platform. And this is what really threw me down the rabbit hole of figuring out what's happening with the erasure of women. And I got harassed for even saying this wasn't fair. And so that's when I started Save Women Sports as just a website to be able to create a safe space for women to feel that they can speak up in this battle. And now we have grown into an international coalition. I have been traveling across the United States, testifying for bills, I have gone all across the country in person and through Zoom because of COVID. We have over 30 states in the United States that are fighting to protect female sports and they have entered over 70 pieces of legislation. So we are working very hard at the grassroots at the ground level. I've had some amazing opportunities through this. Here I am talking on the phone in the background there to the New York Times when I was with Charlie Ray testifying in North Carolina. Uh, I've done live TV and I just want to tell you this little background because I am an average person and I never thought that I would be in this place. And, and if I can do this and do those things, what can you do? You know, it's really crazy what one person can do. So the national and international policies for sports for a college in the United States, the national policies, there is a rule for lowering your testosterone, but they don't exactly clarify what these limits are. So they're basically allowing males full bore to compete in female college. And we have seen athletes like CeCe Telfer, who was ranked in the 200s best as a male, next season come back and take women's championship. And not just the women's championship, but several other awesome awards, women of the week, athlete of the week sort of things that should have been meant for women. And you know, one woman losing out is too many. And this one athlete is stealing multiple titles and records. We've seen that also in Connecticut in high school in the Sewell case. I think a lot of us are aware of that. There are four girls led by Selena Sewell in Connecticut that are suing the Connecticut Athletic Association for allowing the two males, Andrea Yearwood and Terry Miller, to compete. Now, these girls had to race against these two boys all through their high school track seasons in 15 
state championships these two males have. They robbed over 85 opportunities. Selena got cut out of a race where she would have raced in front of college recruiters. So she possibly lost scholarships. It's just absurd. And it is a growing problem. We're seeing it at all ages, at all levels, all across the world. And it shouldn't be up to young girls like Selena Sewell to fight this. We all need to step up and put our stake in the ground and defend the definition of woman because sports is the spearhead of this issue. And they know once they get us, they have the floodgate open and it's gonna be too hard to push back. Now is the time to speak up. I get death threats for doing this, but I found that the more I speak up, the less they come, the more you stand in your truth and they know that they can't get you they just stop and all they have is some silly name calling and we need to realize that it's sticks and stones, you know, it can, words can't hurt you. Um, like I said, women risk losing scholarships, sponsorships. I have a friend who is a cyclist, uh, Jennifer Wagner Asali, you might remember her. She got third place to Rachel McKinnon at his first world championships and she got just harassed, let's say <laughs> lightly in the media and basically had to retreat for a little bit. And she was even told by her racing sponsor for her team that if she didn't shut up about this, they would not sponsor her entire team. So you're talking about athletes that are paying their way, normal moms like me, that this is just a passion and they would have risked losing 50 to $100,000 of racing gear from their sponsor. For, so basically they're putting out gag orders on our athletes. I was recently in Texas just a few days ago at a hearing and many of you might have saw, we were trying to get it to go viral, a legislator who had a Harvard degree in education tried to tell me there are six biological sexes. So I have two minutes to testify and I actually had to cross out part of my story so that I could correct his BS <laughs> in my speech and laid it down the line and let him know there are two sexes and the other quote sexes he was talking about are, are variants of XX or XY. That's what we are, right? And this conflation of language is virulent and it is just insane to think that a Harvard educated person can get away with lying like this to everyone and how these untruths can be brought into group think. And it's just, it's time to call it out. The emperor has no clothes. These are males. These are male bodies trying to compete in female sports and pronouns are poison. Let's call them what they are. And that's how we're gonna win this battle is being truthful, right? Because identities do not play sports bodies play sports. And if these men truly felt like women, they could put our, themselves in our shoes and see why we're fighting for what we are, right? So in closing, I just want to reiterate, I'm an average person. A couple years ago, if you would have told me that I would be traveling across the nation helping make laws, I would have told you you were crazy. But here I am and I'm doing it. Just put on those marching boots, get on the grass level, have tough conversations. That's where it starts and go from there. Sometimes you just feel like you're a keyboard warrior, but those posts, those likes, those comments, they mean a lot. And if you want to join my team, hit us up, info at savewomensports.com. We can help you out if you want to testify. If you're international level, we're starting out some other branches in other countries. Uh, we'd love to have you on our team and together we will save women's sports. So now we're going to Rochelle Dean. She's the Women's Human Rights Campaign Country Contact for the Bahamas, networks extensively in the Caribbean, and she's going to talk to us about sport and what's going on in the Caribbean and Bahamas. We are kind of a little bit back in terms of what's going on globally. So for the most part, because of the fact that, of course, we are a developing nation, um, we comply with the policies of the International Olympic Committee. And so for the most part, um, there hasn't been any personal um, kind of 
policy for our National Olympic Committee. They have just kind of gone with what the International Olympic Committee has um, set in place. And of course, we know that the um, International Olympic Committee has um, made it um, very clear that they are all inclusive. And so they are including the um, transgender um, community. Um, one of the things that was very interesting um, in that sense, um, from our perspective in the Bahamas is that um, the Bahamas 100% agrees with the idea that intersex um, is, a, is, a, is a matter that they would prefer to um, handle in terms of the biology of individuals who have both genitalia. So they 100% agree with um, having um, that biology set the standard in terms of for athletes to compete. And so when we look at um, an intersex individual has two, um, 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 two forms of genitalia, they then have to make that decision. And so for the most part, when it comes to transgender um, individuals and particularly uh, men who you know, tr change over, who have that, um, who transition to men, uh, women, they would have to actually um, have their testosterone levels lowered um, in order to compete um, with women. And so for the um, International Olympic Committee, that then um, the, the result would be a level of fairness. And so the National Olympic Committee here agrees with that just because of, of the fact that it's the biology behind it. Um, and their stance is that it's not personal, it just is what it is in terms of, of the um, International Olympic Committee. And so we know that they haven't changed their policies. Um, one of the concerns um, or, or one of the bigger issues in terms of the International Olympic Committee is of course countries and where they stand in terms of um, human rights. And so one of the things that's very important now we found is that when countries decide that they do want to host the games, their stance on human rights is going to be very, very um, significant to those policies that the International Olympic Committee has set in place. So for the most part, the Bahamas has just complied um, with what um, the International Olympic Committee has set in place. And intersex is um, something that is a concern to them. And we know that when individuals do decide to make that change, whichever way they go, um, if they decide that they're gonna compete against women, they would have to, again, um, have their testosterone um, levels lowered in order for them to compete with women. Um, other than that, I think for the most part, um, the Olympic Games is, is very um, important to the Bahamas. Of course, we have some major athletes and they, they train very hard. And so there is a level of unfairness there for the most part, for, from a personal standpoint. I think they, they are not, um, they're, they're not uh, prepared to compete against um, um, individuals who say that they are women and vice versa. I, I think it's the same for men as well. I think men don't want to compete against women who have a change either. Um, however, we do not have any, um, any protests just because of the fact that the International um, Olympic Committee also says that they um, do not tolerate any forms of protesting. And so for the most part, because of the fact that these athletes work so hard and they train um, very, 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 you know, it's very gruesome for them. They work a lot and, and it's a lot of work put into it. Um, for the most part, I think that they're not kind of prepared to put themselves in the position to um, challenge anything that the International Olympic Committee would set in place. I think it's kind of a, okay, it doesn't affect me, so I'm just going to do what I have to do. Um, I, I do think that we need a bit more of awareness. Um, I did speak out, uh, we reached out to them and they are um, very much so interested in the public education aspect of it because I think the more you find out, the more you learn, I think it's gonna open doors for people to want to network and want to find out and want to be, um, um, want to have that understanding relative to um, how this really does affect people. I think it's more than just biology. I think it's going to change the dynamics of, of the Olympics, of the, of the dynamics of competition, of the dynamics of sports for everyone. And so outside of simply saying, you know, there's science behind it. Um, yeah, you know, we're gonna do this because we're promoting or, or we're promoting um, science. I think there has to be a bit more pushback, especially from the Caribbean, because we really produce some dynamic athletes. You know, they work hard, these people train. And, and overall, I think everybody, you know, for the most part, athletes train very hard in order to compete at a certain level. But um, when we're talking about, um, you know, um, having surgeries to lower testosterone levels and so forth. For me, I think that 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 kind of borderlines um, um, what what individuals do in terms of steroids and things of that nature. So I think we're taking away from 
um, the fact that people naturally train and they, they, you know, they come together and they work hard in order for them to compete to, to win these championships and to um, kind of, you know, break records and so forth. So for the most part, we haven't, because we haven't been challenged with it and and for them, and I think that we're ready for it. The Bahamas and the Caribbean, we're ready for it. We're not saying that, oh, it's never going to affect us. But for the most part, because we haven't had these challenges as yet, I think we've been kind of dormant relative to um, kind of having um, having to push back or even having an opinion relative to it. So I think it's an eye opener um, for the Bahamas, but I, I more or less, I think what Beth is doing is amazing. And I think the fact that she, um, she, she has a voice and what she's doing in the US kind of um, opens the eyes of individuals in the Caribbean so that they can see that these things are real. And in particularly for the Bahamas, because we have no laws relative to transgenders um, and matters of these um, um, sorts, I think it's very important for us to kind of become aware and begin to prepare and begin to have those discussions. So I 100% agree with where she's coming from in terms of starting to have the discussions and wanting to be prepared and ready for whenever this does affect us. But for the most part, I think that um, just because we are a nation that's very compliant, we um, have um, relatively there, there is potential for there to be actual transgender activity within our in, within the realm of sports. I don't know per se um, how that will go over with other athletes, but I do think that we are ready to not only begin to have those discussions, but I think for the most part, um, our National Olympic Committee is ready to meet those challenges when we are faced with them. For the most part, we have 20% women on that committee and they 100% support women. Right, so we're now really pleased to have Emma Hilton. Emma Hilton is from the UK. She's a development biologist and co-founder of Sex Matters. Thank you for having me here today to talk to you about sports, which has become a bit of a specialist subject for me, despite um, my academic work being nothing to do with sports. Um, so I'm a developmental biologist at the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, and I've just, um, me and... Uh, a few other quite prominent women in the UK have founded an organisation called Sex Matters. And we're focusing on um, kind of legal public policy type issues. And I'm there to talk mostly about sex and sports. So I just want to start very briefly by giving a note on the language you might hear me use. And that's because I get an awful lot of complaints about types of language that I use. I work for an academic institution and they have uh, expectations of me as I operate in a public kind of academic domain. Um, my pronoun usage may be very mixed, um, but, but I have to operate using language that other people think is respectful and I'm sometimes used to just using that language um, as I talk about sports. So try not to be too cross if you view me as making um, overly generous compromises on my language. Uh, so lots of people ask me, why am I here? Why is a developmental biologist um, interested in this? And it kind of all started when I, I heard about a, a fighter called Fallon Fox. So this is Fallon Fox on the right. Fallon Fox is, is male. Uh, and transitioned reasonably early, about 20 or so, 20 years old or so. A former uh, Navy veteran who, who transitioned and then became a mixed martial arts fighter. So mixed martial arts is a particularly violent kind of free for all um, combat sport. And um, Fallon Fox is famous for essentially um, breaking the face in, in his uh, first fight uh, against a, a very um, elite female um, MMA fighter called Tamika Breads. And, and this happened back in 2014. Um, there's, a, there's a video of the fight, I'm not gonna show it because it's actually really quite distressing to watch. Well, I find it very distressing, I'm sure you guys would too. Um, and, and essentially Fallon left uh, Tamika with, with the requirement for, for a lot of staples in her head and a fractured orbital socket. Um, so, so broke her face and her head. And I know mixed martial arts is by definition a violent sport, but this, this is something that I don't really feel should have been happening. And what's quite interesting when you watch the video, um, this is a video that a spectator has taken, you know, of a big screen. 
And, and so you can hear the commentary going on in the, the audience for this video. And what you can hear is a male spectator saying, whoa, those girls are getting right into it. Like it's, you know, all fair and a, a, a good kind of fight. And, and a female who's with this person laughing, saying she's getting her ass whooped by a man, laughing, thinking it's funny, thinking that this is, you know, this is fair game. And I remember thinking that's really not funny. It's not funny at all. That's a male, not just hitting a female, but being applauded for hitting a female in the name of sports. And, and that's really something that I want to address. Uh, if you listen to uh, Tamika Brent's after the fight, she said, I fought a lot of women. I've never felt the strength that I felt in a fight as I did that night. I've never felt so empowered ever in my life. And I am an abnormally strong female in my own right. If you look at what Fallon Fox said about that fight, for the record, I knocked two out. He's talking about Tamika and another woman that he knocked out. One woman's skull was fractured, the other not. And just so you know, I enjoyed it. It's bliss, don't be mad. And so that was really the first time I thought, hang on, you know, I'm, a, I'm interested in sports. I'm generally, uh, you know, I play a lot of sports. I'm interested in watching sports. I'm interested in, you know, understanding how sports work. Um, so that was the first real time that I thought there's a problem here. There's a real issue. And then I, I started kind of digging around and came across this story. This is uh, Lucia Riker here. Um, she's, a, she's an elite female kickboxer. She's, she's a very, very good kickboxer. And this is the moment she's knocked out by a um, very average, very junior male. Now, he's not a trans woman. He, he wasn't fighting uh, in the female category as a trans woman. This was an exhibition match. Um, but what you see is how dominant a very average male can be over even a very elite female. This is the moment the male referee took her mouth guard out so she didn't choke. And this is the moment her male coach cradled her head because they weren't sure how badly she was injured. And I'm wondering how that's been allowed to happen, how the regulators, how the people who are supposed to be looking after this, this fabulous female athlete have failed to protect her. And so I started digging some more and I came across Hannah Mouncey, an Australian trans woman, an elite Olympic athlete, uh, transitioning and competing in female handball and then female Aussie rules football. I came across Gabrielle Ludwig, who is a 50 year old male playing college basketball with females. I came across, of course, Rachel McKinnon, uh, sorry, Veronica Ivey, um, uh, competing and, and breaking world records in, in masters cycling and Cece Telfer, female athlete of the year for the NCAA over the hurdles. Uh, JC Cooper, who Beth has spoken about earlier, a powerlifter who um, just wants to compete. Uh, cricketers, uh, Mary Gregory broke female powerlifting records. They were later rescinded because uh, the, the regulatory body said they didn't think it was very fair that a male should win a female record. Uh, Tiffany Abreu, she's a Brazilian volleyballer. She's going to be in the Olympics this year and they may win, win a medal. Um, softball, Junie Swift running in the States. Uh, Kirsty Miller is a, a very vocal advocate and personal stalker of mine. Uh, Joanna Harper, who's leading a lot of this research. Kate Weatherly, who broke into elite female uh, mountain biking after being a very average male. Uh, Mara Gomez breaking women's football records in Argentina. Uh, I've forgotten who that is, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Andrea Yearwood and Terry Miller, who have removed opportunities and potentially scholarships from Selena Sol, who Beth talked about earlier. Uh, you've heard about Petrillo, uh, who I couldn't dig up any data about because you can't find, I didn't even know uh, the, the dead name because it was removed from the record. Uh, Megan Younger in the first female or the first trans woman to run a, a Boston Marathon. Uh, this is a Dutch cyclist whose name I can't pronounce. Uh, Blair Hamilton playing female for it and etc. But this is this is the money shot here. <laughs> Excuse the phrase. This is Laurel Hubbard. This is a 40 odd year old male whose dad is um, involved in the New Zealand Olympic team who transitioned 
um, very old, has taken Pacific titles from um, females and who ironically was probably out of the 2020 Olympics because um, he was injured, but will almost certainly be here now with a year's extra rest. So all of these images, all of these kind of ideas of males actually transitioning and taking space from females to, and, and in this case, taking medals from females. And so that really kind of got my um, like hackles up. Um, so, so asking how it can happen, you look to the sports federations who are regulating these sports. They're usually private bodies. They have a duty to the sport and to the athletes. Now they're obviously under a lot of social pressure from the general public and from lobby groups um, to be inclusive uh, over any other consideration. So we've all seen how Stonewall um, get themselves involved in, in lots of uh, public facing activities and, and you know, successful campaigns to, to improve ostensibly visibility for the entire LGB plus T community. And, and there is a problem with things like homophobia in sports, but what we're actually seeing is the, the standard now takeover where the trans issue is um is is making everything you know pushing everything else aside and they have they have a reason to be a bit afraid this is kind of a um an aside here but in 2016 a trans woman called lauren jessica who is a uk fell runner was actually imprisoned for the attempted murder of a sports official after that sports official asked for a medical proof of their testosterone levels so this is the it's part of the rules and he asked for medical document documentation and she um, took a knife and stabbed him in the head and neck and she's serving 18 years in prison now for that. So, so there's, there's a lot of pressure and, and a threat of you know, harm and violence if you, if you make the wrong decision regarding inclusion. And so because of that, sports federations look to the International Olympic Committee for kind of guidance. It's a bit of an abdication of responsibility at some level. And um, if you can say that someone higher than you has made the rules, you don't really have to justify why you're following those rules. Um, and the IOC rules, which are, are very much not challengeable, as we've heard um, earlier, were originally in 2003 that there had to be some kind of surgical uh, intervention. Um, uh, specifically, the, that males would have to have their testicles removed at least two years before competing. And they had to be legally female and their hormones had to be in line with female profiles, which the surgery achieves. And then in 2015 came this kind of change in response to a human rights um, framework that there would now be no surgical requirement, that there would be no need to be legally female, and that the athletes, male athletes, needed only 12 months of low testosterone. And, and that level of low testosterone is a, a threshold that it exceeds by some measure typical female levels. In fact, it's a, it's a level of testosterone that would be considered reasonably within average, you know, within range for males. And there are male Olympic athletes who naturally fall into that, that boundary. So the assumption has been from the International Olympic Committee that these interventions, these criteria remove male advantage, they make it fair. Um, and I've spent some time kind of challenging that and trying to track their, their justification, certainly their scientific justification, which is very, very loose at zero. I'm not going to go too far into that. I have spoken about this at a Fair Play for Women, Women's Place UK event, and you can find that. Um, you can find me really digging into the IOC uh, uh, pseudo justification for this being a, a kind of fair, um, uh, set of criteria. So, so I started to think, how can I challenge this? How can I kind of not leave it, but where is my expertise here? And how, what do I know about, about this? And how can I legitimately start challenging these rules? And I'm a developmental biologist. Sex is part of my daily work. You know, I'm looking at males and females, I'm looking at male and female humans, I'm looking at male and female animals, I'm, I'm working with sex, I used to research genetic disorders that were lethal for males. There's a very clear kind of um, background here for me about the importance of sex in, in science and medicine. 
Um, but you don't really need to be a scientist to know that human males are bigger and stronger than human females. And this is largely because secondary sex characteristics, so these are the kind of non-reproductive traits that develop during puberty. So they make males very different from females. So both sexes have growth spurts and they both, you know, start feeling horny and that kind of thing. And they all get spots. We all get spots. We've all been through it. <laughs> um, but males particularly have increased height, increased bone density, increased muscle mass. They get a lot hairier than females and they develop an Adam's apple. And this is driven by testosterone during puberty. Females, on the other hand, develop um, very limited uh, amounts of body hair. They have breast growth. Uh, they carry more body fat than males and their hips widen males. That it's their shoulders that widen female hips widen. And this is driven by estrogen. And this is so obvious. I started to look for like a really simple, you know, this is like a uh, primary school, elementary school level. So I started to look for a really simple graphic, kind of a bit tongue in cheek. And I came across this from um, a New Zealand site talking. I wanted to just, you know, some kind of what's the difference during puberty, ha ha ha. And I found this, which describes the differences during puberty, but talks about people with vaginas and people with penises. And I was just like, oh, I'm going to share that, but we won't. Um, I won't discuss that any further. Uh, just a quick note on testosterone levels. You'll hear lots of arguments um, in this arena about how males and females are very overlapping. They are not overlapping. Healthy females and healthy males are very, very different in their natural ranges of testosterone. There is a clear uh, separation here. And even with females who have um, clinical issues like PCOS, so polycystic ovary syndrome, where you have elevated testosterone, those, those females aren't moving into the male range. There's a very narrow range of female testosterone and a very narrow, uh, a slightly wider, but a very separate range of male testosterone. And so all this builds in an evolutionary sense, in a developmental sense, um, an adult male who is designed, <laughs> um, naturally designed, to be a hunter and a fighter. Um, and as I said, these are all very, um, <coughs> excuse me, this is a very long list of, and, and a non, uh, not a comprehensive list of all the differences between males and females. Um, and, and the things that we know about, you know, males are taller, they've got longer arms and longer legs, lower fat, they've got bigger heart and lungs, their muscles are far bigger than they are in females and they're, and they're, they're, they're more efficient at functioning. But down to the, the kind of miscellany, so uh, males, for a reason that we don't know, can hear like audio signals more quickly than females. So that means that on a start line when they're listening for a gun, they've got a, I mean, it's a very, very tiny advantage, but it's still an advantage that is only for males and not females. And um, so obviously this is going to influence sporting performance. All of those differences, males are stronger, they can move faster, they can jump further. When you get down to some of the big gaps between males and females, uh, males can punch harder. And this is a really huge gap. And it kind of goes back to where I entered the debate. That if you look at how in this forward punch motion, so that's how much force a man can move like that. It's over two and a half times uh, stronger, more force, more power than, than women can move their arms like that. It's a huge gap. And so male athletic advantage is large. Um, and it's evident across almost all disciplines. Thousands of males are better than the best females. And I just, I just actually had a look at the uh, various Bahamas sprinters, and um, the Bahamas have a 400 meter Olympic champion at the moment. And I don't, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but Shauna Miller Yubo is the current 400 meter Olympic champion. She's from the, the Bahamas. Um, a great time, 48.37 seconds. She's about a percent and a half slower than the female world record. That's within normal competitive boundaries. She's actually some 12% behind the fastest male Bahaman uh, 400 meter runner. So, so that's a big gap now. We're talking, you know, big separation. Um, the male athletic advantage starts early. Schoolboys, actually, from around 14 to 15 years old, are as, as strong and as fast and as uh, kind of, you know, hardcore as, as elite female athletes, as adult females. And it's insurmountable. The gap between males and females is decades old now. 
and, and some researchers have said women will not run, jump, swim or ride as fast as men. It's just it's a, it's a gap that you can't close. So, so knowing all this, then I, I thought, well, I'm digging out all these kind of data and I need to start writing this up as a scientific exercise. And so that led to a paper that uh, was published last year. Um, and I worked with a guy in the Karolinska called Tommy Lumberg, who had that same year uh, looked at uh, kind of muscle mass and strength in trans women, just as part of their clinical care. So just checking how they're doing, basically. And what he'd noticed and what he'd published was that trans women who are suppressing testosterone and their testosterone levels are within the kind of Olympic guidance um, don't really lose much muscle mass and they don't lose much strength. So in fact, he found they, they lost very, very little, if any strength, um, over the 12 months that would qualify them for Olympic competition. And, and we thought together that his is not the only paper that's got that kind of data in it. Let's go and find all the papers that have got that kind of data and put them all together and make like a review paper. So this came out in, I think it was December last year. And, and it's made a bit of a splash. So, so you can get various metrics. This is not to um, blow my own trumpet. This is really just to illustrate how much of a kind of global issue this is and how much interest there is in it. If you take 17 and a half million academic publications across all fields. Um, ours is nearly within the top 2,500 of, of papers that cover every science and every kind of social science. And, and if you look at the map of where it's being shared, we're, we've, we're getting kind of good global coverage. So people are really interested in this and people are invested in, in understanding fairness in sports. So it's quite a popular, you know, it's a popular kind of leisure pursuit for a lot of the world. And we're starting to get picked up in, in reviews about regulations and people recognizing, for example, that people, not males, uh, we have to say people now, can continue to benefit from past testosterone levels after hormone therapy. So, so we're making a splash and that's good because we want people to, to take notice and we, and we wanted to be very academic about providing good resources that sports vets could then use. And we made a really simple argument. It's a very different argument from what had been made before, but we made a very simple argument. And that's because I'm a developmental biologist and we work from the bottom up, not from the top down. So, so the argument we constructed was that males have performance advantage. It's acquired at puberty, it's large, and females need a protected category for fairness and for safety, depending on the sport. The performance advantage is underpinned by big muscles and being tall. Um, this is a package of male advantage that leads to qualitatively different bodies. We're not talking about quantities, we're not talking about amounts, we're talking about male bodies that are categorically different to female bodies. And that males who suppress testosterone do not shrink, nor do they lose meaningful amounts of muscle. And so the, there's, no, um, there's no evidence to suggest that it's okay for this subset of males to compete within the female category. And that inclusion in the female category compromises fairness and safety. And for those of you who, who don't want to or struggle, perhaps, or are a bit kind of intimidated by engaging with scientific, you know, it's, it can be quite boring to read even for scientists. I have made a lay summary of that paper and you can find that on my blog. So there's been a lot of resistance. I'm a, you know, transphobe. I've been reported for hate crime. Um, there's Reddit threads about me. There is a YouTube video, which is just a 45 minute stream of often irrelevant nonsense. I get called names in various internet agencies, that kind of thing. And the, the key argument that's always pushed back and we've, we'll all have seen it is where's the harm? Like, where is the harm here? There's so small a number of, of these trans women who want to compete that can't we all just, you know, turn a blind eye and make an exception. And in fact, when the International Olympic Committee first instituted their rules, they, they, they said one in 12,000 males has gender dysphoria. And so the number of transitioned males who would even, of those who would be sporty and of those who would be competitively sporty would be negligible. And they wrote this really patronizing kind of 
opinion which said that it probably won't matter because it's going to be older males and so they're only at master's level nobody cares about master's level sports or it will be kids and nobody really cares about school sports and I, I just found this quite horrifying but, but the argument was the IOC was saying we don't expect to have to deal with too many of these cases and and that's quite a common argument now that you know we we see on Twitter quite a lot to uh, other social media platforms. No trans person has ever been in the Olympics. Um, why are we thinking about regulating a group of athletes who really don't make any impact? And uh, to the point where people create all these graphics, there's never been a trans person in the Olympics. And I would argue they're not really looking hard enough when they ask, "Where's the harm?" Because you only have to look, we're not looking at these males now, look at those women, look at the females who are losing out. And at that point, numbers don't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a systematic domination of female sports. Every single one of those females has lost something. It may not appear to be something massive. It may not always be a medal as it was in the case here, but it may be a scholarship. It may be a place at the start line. Maybe they weren't going to win. It doesn't matter. It was their place. And of course, some women are going to suffer harm, physical safety harm because of this. So trying to make a change with this kind of scientific uh, framework that I can work with. Um, USA Powerlifting have been really good. They were the first sports federation to actually ban transgender women from competing in the, the female category. And that was led by a medic called Chris Hunt, who was the head of doping, who ran these wonderful analyses, these very strong statistical analyses, saying, you can't, there's nothing, there's nothing males can do that make it fair. Um, and I've been involved in efforts by World Rugby, who again last year uh, said that they, they couldn't include transgender women at international level in the female category. And there's just a little picture just to highlight, there's me, there's Tommy Lumberg, who I wrote the review with, and you'll see Nick Williams from Fair Play for Sport there. Um, so that was really quite major. This is an international sports body saying, uh, you know, the IOC rule is not fit for purpose and it's not safe. Rugby is a dangerous sport and it is not safe. I've used my work to help um, write some of these bills. Uh, one specifically I was quite involved with in South Dakota that actually has been passed um, by an executive order. Uh, so, so South Dakota have protected their, their female high school athletes from having to compete against males. And um, although of course that was reported that transgender girls are being banned from sport, which we know is not true, that's, that's propaganda. And so currently I'm working with an international think tank, I can't say too much, but they've commissioned me to do a piece of work because they want to challenge their domestic policies, uh, which have been overrun by, by inclusion first without consideration for, for women. Um, and the RFU, that's the um, English uh, sports body that governs rugby in the UK, in England rather, they're currently running an external consultation on, on their inclusion policy. And I'm writing that uh, as part of my sex matters work. But that is something that the general public can, can write in. And I do understand when you look at these kind of uh, formal responses, these formal consultations, they're you know, tens of pages long and they're references and footnotes and all this. There is a template for what Beth has referred to as the average person. Now I agree with you all in the chat, Beth is not an average person by any stretch. But there is a template because it is a very simple argument. You only need to make three points when you write an email or write a letter. There is large male athletic advantage that means females need a sport, that, you know, their own category, that testosterone suppression doesn't work in any meaningful sense. And that if you continue to include, it creates fairness and perhaps safety issues for those females. And something that gets lost is listening to female athletes. World Rugby were really good when they ran their um, consultation review. They surveyed international female rugby players and some of the quotes are astonishing. The female athletes are not in favour of inclusion. In fact, there's a majority saying 
we don't want to have males in our sport. And for example, there is such a physiological difference between men and women. I'm one of the biggest on the circuit and even I would never play with men. So if you want to get involved, and everyone's done this kind of <laughs> further contacts and that kind of thing, if you want to get involved, please have a look at our website at Sex Matters. We're, we're quite new, so we're still building our resources. But in the UK, Fair Play for Women is a really good start. And obviously you've heard from Beth today in the US um, and now creating kind of franchises, if you like, around the world um, to find out how you can get involved, whether that's from an academic kind of angle or whether you just want to, you know, go and wave a banner outside a, a stadium. So it comes up a lot, um, as you can imagine, uh, how to understand athletes with DSD, so disorders of sex development. Um, and how, how we can achieve a kind of fair categorization in sport. And Casta Semenya is obviously a, a kind of poster child for this, this issue. So I always start with a disclaimer that athletes with DSDs are not the same as trans athletes. They are not healthy biologies. Um, and so, so what we can understand about athletes with DSDs does not um, necessarily map to how we understand uh, trans athletes, specifically trans women. Um, so Casta Semenya has a DSD that is biolog biologically male, um, which, which probably has led to some genital ambiguity and, and a female observation at birth. Or, or certainly a you know female marker on the birth certificate, um, but her her advantage is a is a male typical advantage. It's acquired at puberty and causes you know uh, male typical levels of muscle and and all of those changes, um, that that males undergo and that that underpin the reason why males are excluded from the female category, um, and I've shared this before. I don't really mind saying I don't think Casta Semenya should be permitted to compete in female categories. I think that's a D the DSD she has is is one that I don't think can be incorporated into the female category and have it remain fair. There are um, kind of male DSDs where where we can assume there is fairness because we don't really see how they can create a male typical performance advantage to so something like um, complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. Uh, these are these are women who who have have had such disrupted development from what would be a, a male path that, that, that they that, you know they are, are female for, for every aspect of their their physical nature and, and that doesn't include any kind of male typical performance advantages so so there's an exception to the kind of xx female sport there so it's, it's quite difficult but, but people kind of group dsds together and just say 46 xy male you know we treat those all the same and actually it's a little bit more nuanced than that and i think you know people with these dsds deserve a bit more kind of um, they deserve their own conversation about this and a, and a kind of more personalised understanding.